Welcome to chapter three, where we start to get into the component parts of a service gap model. This chapter is all about the consumer. And we're starting to look here at the service expectations and the factors and component parts that really influence why and how a customer generates their expectation of a service. So what we're really wanting you to understand from this element of the text is what are the consumer behavior theories that are in play here? So what aspects of your knowledge of other factors of marketing can you bring to apply? How do customers come about to creating these expectations? And what can we do as marketers to either lower an unreasonable expectation, raise a previously lowered expectation, and understand when a customer has a set of expectations, what our roles can be as service providers to meet, exceed, or satisfy. So to do this, first thing we really want to understand is that there is a sliding scale Scale. It's a spectrum of expectation. And we think about this from low to high. We have a minimum, everyone has a minimum standard. Everyone has a basic level that they won't go below in a customer encounter, in a service, for a product. There are some movies so bad you won't watch them. There are some songs you won't listen to. There are some baseline elements where you go, okay, this is below what I'm prepared to tolerate. A minimum tolerable expectation is the point where you go, there is a series of trade-offs happening here. It's cheap, we'll put up with it. Uh, my social circles, we have a particular catchphrase which refers to the price of buying a DVD or buying a movie was for five bucks, how bad could it be? And the answer on a regular basis was quite bad. But as a trade-off, it was here's a it's five dollars, it's worth it's worth a try. And became an experiential aspect of if it was so bad we couldn't finish it, it was five dollars well spent because it was a terrible experience and we got to laugh about it and make fun of it later. So we modified our expectations because it was super cheap, we had super low expectation, and then anything that was better than terrible got the benefit of very low expectations. So when we start talking about the zone of tolerance and the desired service and the ideal expectations, there's a huge gap between cheap and terrible and a good outcome. So on this sliding scale, what we also get here is a set of ought to's and expectations. There is a level of acceptable. You basically don't think about these per se until they're breached. So your expectations of what's acceptable is almost invisible to you until something goes wrong, until those expectations aren't met, in which case they suddenly become very visceral and very apparent to you. Your next one up is experienced norms are where you've dealt with the service previously, so you know what to expect, and you know that you will give difference. You'll understand the differences in performance. For example, you go to your favorite fast food restaurant, and it's crowded. You know that, okay, there's going to be slow service because there's a finite space on the grill, and the last time you were here and it was crowded, you know, you had to wait 45 minutes. Faster than that, better than last time, beats expectation. You then also have the normative or the a service of this type and nature should have the following features. These are assumptions and expectations. So I'm paying a lot of money, it should be good is an expectation of price is an indicator of quality. Lastly, you've got the ideals, the super high end of customer expectations. It's the ideal expectation or the ideal desire. These may not actually be achievable 
you may only satisfice rather than satisfy. And the satisfice is basically a compromise position, position where the customer knows that their ultimate ideals can never be met, but if you get close to it, they're okay with that. So the first thing I want you to do with this chapter, and particularly looking at the textbook and the materials in the text, is I really want you to go and pour over the customer expectations and these five levels. I also want you to think about what are your own levels and expectations when it comes to fast food, to restaurant, to service delivery on campus. So what do you expect from a service that you would get to access, say, the library, the bookshop, or the refec here on campus? Do they differ between what you would expect, say, between the refectory or the cafe on campus and the food courts in, say, North Quarter in Civic? Is there a difference in your expectations by where the service is being delivered? So I want you to think about that. Because unpacking your own expectations, unpacking your own experience of service consumption is an important facet of the course. So let's talk about now breaking apart the gap between adequate and desired. And we refer to this as the zone of tolerance. Everybody has a lower end, a minimum end, that they are prepared to put up with. Take, for example, mobile phones. What you really want is five-star, five-band coverage and high-speed streaming at all times. What you're prepared to accept is three throughout most of the campus, the occasional black spots, and four to five when you happen to be somewhere where you don't really need your phone. Your adequate service is three, your desired service is five, your zone of tolerance is if it stays between three and four band, three and four bars, service is okay. So the zone of tolerance factor means that services are also, because they're inconsistent, heterogeneous and intangible, you have a bit of wiggle room. You have a bit of room where as a customer, you are thinking, well, yeah, it was okay, or yeah, it was great. So built into this is the three concepts of the must, the desirable, and the delight. Adequate service has the basic components, the must need, the must meet. It cannot go below these and still be adequate. Now, I think I understand that this bench line is capable of compromising everything. If you dip below adequate service on one of five elements and hit delightful on the other four, the customer will still be talking about the customer service as a service value. So you're going to make your minimums. You're going to hit your basics first. In the zone of tolerance is the desirable. For example, the must on going out to a restaurant is the food is cooked properly. The desirable is the food is delivered quickly. Yeah, focus on the fast food restaurants. The delight is it's fast, it's quick, and it's really tasty. But if you've gone out for a quick refuel, you're hitting uh, McDonald's at 3 a.m. on a Wednesday morning because you're pulling an all-nighter for an assignment, your musts are the food is edible, your desirables are it's ready now, and your delight is this place is still open and I can get something to eat. So your frameworks are a little bit different. In the delight factor, there's a couple of things that need to be understood here. Is that when you exceed the desired service, you are delighting the customer, but you're also changing the service encounter and changing the service experience. And if you delight the customer too frequently, it's going to move up the bottom line of what's regarded as adequate and what's regarded as desirable. Hence, the zone of tolerance is a target area to try and land in, occasionally exceed, but preferably never drop below adequate. 
So tolerance, again, there's breadth and each service has a certain level of variation. They can be very narrow. The gap between desired, must and delight on medical services is pretty tight. You want to be treated well, quickly and right first time as your musts, but also being treated well, quickly and on time as your delights are the same thing. They are an aspect that evolves and changes. Zone of tolerance moves. Zone of tolerance varies amongst individuals. What one person is willing to put up with as the minimum differs. So across this class, what you regard as acceptable baseline for food service and food delivery and food flavor is going to vary amongst everyone in the room and everyone watching this video. So this, what you're looking for then is that the zone of tolerance can be used as a segmentation tool. What is the baseline measure? What's the minimum? What's the maximum? And it will vary by product service and product type. So what you create in this aspect is that we have a certain level of expectation, but this also will change across the five dimensions. Now we are going to talk more about the five dimensions of services. Reliability is one of the key ones. But reliability and empathy, now empathy being the understanding that the providers show, you may have a complete, you don't care if the provider is friendly, cranky or angry, so long as the provider gets the job done. You have a very low standard of adequacy for empathy, but a very high standard for reliability. You don't want to be friends with your service provider, you want your service provider to get it right first time. So the less... So the elements here, particularly the uh, service dimensions, these come into play when we start talking about service quality and service quality, but they are factors that you can control and adjust, but they are also aspects where pe different people and different markets will have a different level of demand for each of these component elements. So let's talk about the underpinning frameworks. What is it that makes the desired service? So there are three component parts here. Again, I'm going to briefly point you to them because I want you to explore these in the text. And again, particularly this model is really important for you to use as a self-diagnostic tool to understand how your own influences on desired service, adequate service, and the zone of tolerance, how these impact on you personally. As you unpack this, you get to use your own experience to understand and interpret the theory. Because it's very internal driven and the zone of tolerance is variable between people, this is the one of the best ways to explore the material is through personal your own personal experience. Which is why I'm getting you to read the chapter and why I'm explaining to you the importance of you playing your co-production role here. You have to co-produce the learning element here by unpacking your own self and your own behavior. So in desired service, we have the personal needs. And these are the philosophical, the you know, consumer behavior. We look at these in terms of uh, there'll be cultural elements, there'll be attitude, normal component parts. There'll be a lot of stuff underneath this, but this is needs and wants. Now in a service encounter, if you have a high locus of control, that you have a very strong need to be in command, to drive the traffic, to direct uh, what's happening, you're going to go for a customer, your desired service is going to need customization and personal control, and personal influence over the service outcome. On the other hand, if you have a very low locus of control and you're very laid back, your desired service is you instruct, they do. As in, you order, I'll have a, the number seven, the number 18, the number 22, which would be a strange way to run a taxation service, but still feasible. And they do the work. You don't want to have to do, you don't want to have to drive, you don't want to have to supervise, you want the stuff done. You want to be able to walk into a hairdresser and say, you surprise me, and get a, a haircut at the end of it that you're satisfied with. But you don't want to have to direct each part, like you know, a little bit here and there and colour, and you don't want that much control. 
You also have in the desired service your derived service expectations from what's happened previously or services of a like manner. And this is where it's really important to understand that if you constantly, if you get, attend a service, so the first time you go to this restaurant, the entrees are amazing. It's just like the most amazing food experience you've had in ages. It's one of the best nights you've had. When you go back there, your desired service is going to have been informed by what happened last time. So your understanding of you go to another restaurant that offers similar types of food, you're going to desire it to be as good. When we bring in then from derived service expectations, so you've looked at what you think is going to be there as well. The other thing on the der derived service expectations is the cues from the social environment. If you've had to go and hire a suit to go to this restaurant because nothing you had in your wardrobe was good enough for their dress code, and you've taken out a small bank loan to be able to afford the dinner, and you had to book the tickets in advance through a, an online lottery, and you've laid out $600 as your upfront fee with drinks on top, boy, do you have a set of expectations that have been derived from everything that's happened at this point in time. Now, when it comes to the adequate service, you then drop down to two other elements. What do you think is in terms of the alternatives? How much competition is in the market? What's going to be adequate if there's one provider in this town? It's, you want this done, there is one person you're going to. You're going to tolerate a lot, because where else are you going to go? As soon as there's two, three, five, or ten providers, then you are going to not tolerate much. Your adequate service level goes up based on competition, based on knowing you can do better somewhere else that there's a different provider who can offer you a better alternative, or you think they can offer you a better alternative, will raise your lower bar, the lower bar of the zone of tolerance. Situational factors from consumer behavior. If you remember that there are permanent factors which influence the consumer's behavior, and there are factors that are conditional. Who you're with, what time it is, personal internal conditions, how well you're feeling, are you tired, are you happy, what do you pre -exist, what's your pre-existing state before you come to the service? When you go to see a movie, you don't really want to go out, so you promised your mates, you feel obliged versus you're really keen, or you've got time to kill and you're bored, you just want something to occupy your time. These situational factors change your perception. So what's baseline is going to be in that. Again, from a marketer's perspective, these are some of the these are difficult elements to control, but from a consumer's perspective, these are critical elements to what you perceive. All right, let's look at the marketer element. What are, now I left predicted service out previously because this is an element that I want to integrate with the marketer control. Predicted service, what's the bottom line you think you're gonna get? What do you think is going to happen when you go to this service encounter? If it does happen, you've met the basics. Like, yeah, this is going to be all right. Hey, it's all right. Predictive service, adequate service. But what do you base those predictions on? Explicit service promises? That's IMC. That's one of the other gaps. Implicit service promises? That's your interpretation walk into a restaurant and there is a strong smell of wood oak and there are glasses of dozens of different shapes and varieties and types you've never seen before around the bar you think all right the wine list here is going to be spectacular it's going to go for several pages and have a bunch of flowchart diagrams to explain how it works because the cues the physical environment cues are giving you implicit service promises the uniforms being worn you walk into a massage or a physiotherapy place and they are wearing aprons that look like they could be splattered with some form of, you know, we're not really sure. You're going to get nervous. You walk into somewhere where it's like they're wearing lab coats. You know, welcome to the, yeah. welcome to your sports massage place. They're wearing lab coats and dental masks. You're going to be like, hang on, what happens here? 
because the uniforms are going to be implying and the implications. So your interpretation of the surrounding cues. There's also word of mouth communication. What do you know about this place from your friends, from what you've heard from recommendations? And the past experience. Now, I keep raising past experience, but this is crucial. This influences both your needs, your perception of the alternatives, what you think is going to happen, and then what did happen last time. And past expectation has a huge impact on services, which is why if you are dealing with recurring loyal customers, you've got to be really careful about ensuring that you don't under promise, over deliver, and then creeping, just creep up this um, zone of expectation by the huge gaps between adequate and perceived that they start going, wow, this place is so much better than I expected. And they come to depend on that gap, that difference between what you thought was going to happen and what actually happened. So these are the component parts the internal component parts. From your perspective for this semester, you're going to want to really appreciate and understand these elements. You're going to want to look at how they influence your own services perception. You also want to look at the perception modification. Now there are a series of options on here that you can now self-modify. For example, this course, you perceived service alternatives. Well, it's not like you can learn this content in another subject here. Like I said, we specialize on our subjects for that reason. But what you can do is you can look at and say, well, I've got the textbook, I've got the pre-recorded slides, I've got the classroom, I've now got competition across those three. What's going to be okay for me with the slide deck? What's going to be okay for me with the textbook? What combination of my own participation here will give me the desired service I'm looking for, will give me the adequate education I'm looking for. Where's my zone of tolerance in my own performance on my assignments? Where's my zone of tolerance on my own performance as a self-service provider in my own education? What's my desired? What's my adequate? And where's my zone of tolerance? Self-analyze. Use the stuff to unpack your own expectations. So the last thing about customer expectations, let's look at a couple of questions. Firstly, what do we do if the expectations are unrealistic? Con and as part of this, the consequences, should we always try to delight the customer? If we constantly exceed our expectations and we constantly do better than expected, are we creating sort of a services marketing arms race where we are putting ourselves into positions of failure or perceived failure because we were doing better than expected and we can't reach that delight phase consistently because we can't always over deliver. And lastly, when we're looking at competition, when we're looking at multiple providers of similar services, how do we keep meeting the customer and ex customer's expectations without pushing ourselves past the point of no return for going past delight and raising the zones of tolerance, but how do we be a better alternative? How do we have the relative advantage over our competitors through delivery on expectation? And particularly what I'd like you to look at and think about in your own readings and your own exploration of the subject is how do we modify down customer expectation? How do we control customer expectation so that we rate maintain a realistic expectation against their experience of our services. How do we teach them that, okay, this service felt like the greatest thing that ever happened, but it's, you might want to tone it back a bit. You might want to bring it down a notch so that the next time you have the service, it doesn't, you don't feel disappointed that you didn't have a life changing experience every time you went there. So what do we do with customer expectations? That's one for you to think about, that's one for you to analyze and look around the readings to see because that's probably the area you're most needing to appreciate is as someone who will be providing services through your personal skills, through in the workplace, your skills and your abilities, 
If you get a reputation as a miracle worker, how do you always produce those miracles? Or how do you tone down your reputation? As always, if you need me over the email or on the Twitter account, customer expectations are keep up to what you need to appreciate. Also for what you are going to be dealing with in terms of managing your own personal reputation as someone who, as an employee, as a fellow staff member, that you are a service provider within your organization. Also within your groups for group assignments this semester, you are going to need to manage your expectations, both of your group members, what do you expect of your peers, and also what do they expect of you. So expectation management will come into effect inside the course itself when you start getting into group-based exercises. And with that, that's the chapter.